Chapter 26 Billy awoke and for a moment didn't know where she was or how she'd come to be there. Her back ached, her arms and legs were sore, her mouth was gummy. Puzzling, but in its own way, it was one of the happiest moments of her life. She had no baggage. Then she remembered. The lid of the chamber fanned up, the circulators kicked on, and a breeze of stale ship air wafted over her. She heard the click of Wilkes's sleep chamber as the lid yawned like a hydraulic clamshell, saw him wince and turn his head as he came awake. Wilkes sat up, rubbed at his eyes, stuck his tongue out. He looked over at Billy and nodded. Time to rise and shine, he said. His voice was a hoarse croak. Another glorious day in the core. Billy stared at him. That's what my old platoon sarge used to say. Every time we finished a session in <clears throat> one of these suckers, Wilkes said. What happened to him? Something he disagreed with ate him. The two of them padded to the showers and cranked the sprayers on. Billy stripped unselfconsciously and stepped under the water. The spray was more of a drizzle, but the water was hot and she felt some of the soreness from the months of sleep ebb under the warmth. Wilkes looked at her, taking in her nakedness, then turned back to let the water soak his hair and run down his face and body. Billy saw the scars on his body, some worse than the one on his face, marks of combat she supposed, either in wars or pubs or on some street somewhere. She wondered why he hadn't had the scars resected and wiped. Even with the marks on his body, he was in pretty good shape for somebody old enough to be her father. Nice ass. Funny, she'd never really thought of Wilkes that way, except in her nightmares. But that was more or less a standard feature of her dreams, had been since she was a kid. A monster tearing itself out of somebody she knew. All the more horrible because it had actually happened to some of the people she had known. Her parents. Her brother. Wilkes turned around to let the water play on his neck and back, and Billy glanced down. If he thought of her in a sexual manner, it sure didn't show. It was kind of difficult for a man to hide that kind of reaction. Not that she had all that much experience with men, there had been a few, but one didn't grow up in a hospital without learning a few things about anatomy. She knew what went where, and what it had to look like before it could get in there. There was no salute from Wilkes to show any interest in her as a woman. How long were we asleep? Wilkes, eyes closed against the steam of the hot water, shrugged. I don't know. I didn't check the meter. But if the ship woke us up, we must be close to where we're going. What now? We finish our showers, get something to eat, figure out our next move after that. One thing at a time. Billy nodded, leaned forward a little so the water could trickle down her spine. Maybe that was the only way to get through life without going crazy. Take it one thing at a time. Little bites you could chew without choking. Spears made the discovery almost by accident. He'd been awake for six hours, had cleaned up and eaten a meal dressed in ship fatigues and run a few system checks. This latter was more for his peace of mind than anything else, the ship's operational computer being sufficient to handle virtually all the chores without regulation from him. But being a careful man, he occasionally checked to be certain things were running as they should. In this case, things were not running as they should. A tracking system on the cargo ship floating there a couple of clicks behind the Jackson said that two of the sleep chambers had been activated and utilised during the trip through hyperspace. Water had been drained from the storage tanks and then fed back into the recycler. Power consumption was up slightly from that necessary to maintain the troops in their suspension tanks. Oxygen consumption was also higher than it should be. On the face of it, there were two scenarios that came to mind. One, a malfunction, either in his computer or the internal systems on the MacArthur. Or two, somebody unauthorised was on that ship. They'd slept in the chambers and were now breathing the air, drinking the water, 
and using the light. There would be food stores being eaten too. Other than the drive, Spears had not thought to slave the ship's internal controls to his board. It hadn't seemed necessary. He had no eyes on the cargo ship, no way to shut down the air or the power. True, he did have some weaponry on the Jackson capable of disabling or even destroying his companion vessel. But the last thing he wanted was for anything to happen to his precious cargo. He leaned back in the form chair and looked at the computer-generated info crawl. All right, so there were a couple of stowaways on the ship behind him. No big deal. They didn't know that he knew they were there. When he put down on Earth, he would take care of the problem before they knew what hit them. A pair of deserters or frightened human troopers wouldn't give him any trouble. A concussion grenade through the hatch and anybody standing around would be out of it. The tactical advantage was his. They were still a couple of weeks away from landing. He had plenty of time to plan the best way to take care of snivelling ship rats. Meanwhile, there were other things to do. He had to get himself prepared for the coming battle. War was imminent, and about damn time too. Wilkes exercised, using parts of the ship not designed for such activity, but things that could be made to work. A thick pipe for chins, a pair of stools for dips and push-ups, anything he could hook his feet under for crunches. He worked hard at it, harder than he would have had he been alone on the ship. That episode with Billy in the shower had called up a bunch of mixed emotions. On the one hand, he remembered her as a ten-year-old child, crying in fear as he saved her from the death her parents had suffered. On the other hand, standing next to her in the shower, he saw that she was a grown woman, attractive, and it had been too long since he'd been with somebody that way. Billy had done it with Beulah, Wilkes knew that. But Jesus, he was old enough to be her father, and for a brief time had more or less functioned in that role. True, he hadn't seen her for a decade or so after he rescued her, and that child and this woman hardly seemed related. Still, it wouldn't be good to let these thoughts continue. Not at all. He finished his third set of fifty crunches, his belly burned, the muscles dancing on the edge of cramps. He lay on the deck, sweat beaded all over him. He'd been working out for about an hour. He was done. He'd run the water cold in the shower this time. Billy opened a meal packet. The reconstituted and heated food in the plastic container smelled like meat and gravy, with vegetables on the side, though it was all soy pro. Wilkes entered the galley and nodded at her. She opened a second packet for him. They ate in silence for a minute. It had been three days since they dropped out of warp, and Wilkes had spent much of the time exercising. Are you avoiding me? She said. He looked up from his food. No. Why do you ask? You seem... distracted. He stared at the brown goop in his container. No, I was just working on the plan, that's all. Thinking. Yeah? Yeah. You want to let me in on it? Well, it's a little rough. I'm not going anywhere. Okay. I'm pretty sure we're in the solar system. I can't do shit with the instruments. They're all locked out, but it makes sense. With the G-Drive, it won't take long for us to get to Earth. Couple of weeks, tops. We'll be moving along at a good pace of light speed, and the last few days we'll be coasting, then using retro drive to slow down. All right, I follow that. So once Spears puts it in reverse, we're decelerating at the same rate. The ships, him, us. If we suit up and go EVA, we can use the suit's squirters to accelerate. We're all moving faster than a speeding bullet, but it's relative. Well, since he doesn't know we're here, maybe we surprise him long enough to make it there. Maybe. Uh, yeah. He'll have proximity mass detectors, plus radar, and Doppler and Luxflect. If he happens to be sitting in front of a sensor screen, He'll see us coming. 
or probably there's an alarm rig to tell him something is coming if he happens to be on the crapper. Then he shoots us to pieces, right? Maybe not. Maybe he just cuts the retros and leaves us hanging in vac with no place to go. Assuming our ship doesn't splatter us like bugs on a flitter's windscreen when it speeds up and zips on by. Why does this not sound like a good idea to me? Or we could wait until we get where we're going and clonk him over the head when he opens the door to our ship to let his tame monsters out to pee. That's Earth, right? where there are a million more monsters, none of them tame. No thanks. All right. His detectors are likely set to pick up ship-sized masses or stuff approaching at high speed. Asteroids, space crap, stuff like that. So, if we catch up real slowly, maybe the system doesn't kick in until we're right on top of him. Sounds kind of iffy. I could go down to the engine room and take a hammer to the drive. If it didn't go spastic and warp us into a subcompacted ball, which it could, maybe we could disable it and make him come to see what's wrong. He doesn't want to lose this cargo. I don't like that plan much at all. Me neither. So unless you've got something better, I say we wait until he hits the brakes and then we go to him. Billy sighed. It's always something, isn't it, Wilkes? Never boring being around you. That's me. Life of the party. In his cabin, Spears laid out his uniform for the initial upcoming battle on Earth. He'd saved one dress uniform, the billed cap with the gold braid and his star, the regulation black silks with his ribbons and medals, the Evershine orthoplast over the calf boots. He'd wear a belt with his two antique revolvers and the uniform's dress sword. Strictly speaking, of course, it wasn't SOP to wear dress blacks and ceremonial weaponry into a combat suit, but since he was going to be on scene, he wasn't going to lead the new troops into battle. No, he would command from the rear this first time. He was too valuable to risk himself in this foray. Too bad. He'd never considered himself a Remph, a rear echelon motherfucker. No armchair commander. But in this case, he would have to forego the pleasure of standing shoulder to shoulder with his men when the guns began to speak. He would be the most valuable man on the field, not simply because he was the only man on the field, but because if something happened to take him, the war was over. Only he and the Queen could command these soldiers, and he could hardly trust her to continue the fight if he were gone. No, he would stand back this once, until he had more troops, more humans to help him. He was, after all, the commanding general of the Colonial Marines now. Indeed, commander-in-chief of all military forces. And why not? Once he brought back records of his success, once he showed whoever was left how the job had to be done, who would dare deny him his rank. And if anybody could be that stupid, a wave of his hand would remove the obstacle. Sick em, boys. Spears smiled. It was all going so well. Aside from a minor glitch back at third base, nothing the historians would linger over unduly, everything had run as smoothly as lube on glass. It was only a matter of days now. All the years of preparation were about to pay off. He rehung the uniform, put the sword and boots away. He had decided to land in South Africa, a northeastern section of which was once called the Natal province. In the late 1800s, the area had been ruled by a native named Kethwayo, who commanded a large army of warriors known as the Zulu. They were fierce fighters, the Zulu, and there had been a lot of them. But even so, they'd been no match for the technologically advanced British when it came to war. In one famous battle, a small unit of British soldiers withstood an assault against a vastly superior number of Zulu for some days due to their better weapons, tactics and training. Spears related to that. A tiny force, well directed and focused, stopped an entire army. 
all things being equal, it was the commanders who decided battles. The aliens were fierce, savage, hard as iron, but they fought like ants. They had not learned the arts of war, as had men, and few, if any men, knew those arts as well as spears did. Give me a lever and a place to stand, and I will move the galaxy, Spears thought. He had his place, his lever flew in the ship behind him. He was so full of anticipation, he could hardly breathe.